So Michelle, hi, our managing editor. Thank you very much for hosting us today. I'm Jeff Gedman with American Purpose. Thanks to Luke Phillips and Braver Angels for co-sponsoring today. You'll hear a word from Luke in just a moment. I'm going welcome Pete. I'm going to allow Michelle to have the honors of introducing our distinguished guest of honor in just a moment. Michelle is our managing editor, which uh, has a job description that goes on for pages and pages. But there are a number of reasons why she's uniquely suited to host and moderate the discussion today. Michelle, let me just give it to you. And as you wish and see fit, let us know what we're going to do and how. And you have the floor. Thank you so much, Jeff. It is my great pleasure to be moderating today and have Pete, my old boss from White House, be trading with us. Before I do the introduction, Luke, did you want to say a word as co-host, co-sponsor here from Braver Angels? Well, uh, thank you, American Purpose, for uh, offering to co-sponsor this with us and uh, all folks in the room who are coming from the Braver Angels grassroots community around the United States. Uh, welcome to uh, an American Purpose event. Uh, American Purpose uh, graciously works with us on the America's Public Forum program and other series. And uh, sometimes we work with them on their event series as well. So it's always a good uh uh, discourse space for uh, for interesting conversations with great Americans thinking great things, and we are honored to be working with them today. So uh, I will be posting links to American Purpose and Pete's book in the chat soon. And uh, uh, all Braver Angels folks here, I highly encourage you to follow American Purpose. They do very wonderful work. Thank you so much, Luke. And we're so honored as well to be partnering with you because Braver Angels is doing what we all think America needs, which is bringing people together to have dialogues, important, difficult dialogues across the political spectrum. So Pete, I would love to introduce you now. Um, Pete Weiner is an in-residence senior fellow at the Trinity Forum, a New York Times columnist and Atlanta contributing editor. He has served in three Republican administrations, most notably Deputy Director of White House Speech Writing and Director of the Office of Strategic Initiatives under George W. Bush. Since 2015, I think to many minds, he's the most clear-eyed exponent of the dangers that Donald Trump poses to the Republic. Uh, he's co-author of two books, one with Mike Gerson, City of Man, Religion and Politics in a New Era, one with Arthur Brooks, Wealth and Justice, The Morality of Democratic Capitalism, and his most recent book, The Death of Politics, will be pretty much the backdrop of today's discussion. We'll get an update since this was written a few years ago. Pete, welcome. Uh, sorry for the long-winded introduction, um, but would you please kick things off by telling us what your main aims and hopes were when you wrote sure. The Death of Politics? Sure. Thanks, first, Michelle, for uh, inviting me and uh, being a friend and former colleague. So those were those were good years together and to... Uh, Braver Angels and, and Luke uh, for co-sponsoring it. Between American Purpose and Braver Angels, those are two really good institutions. And that's one of the problems in American life today, which is too many institutions are failing um, and yours are succeeding. So I appreciate that. And, and also Jeff, thanks for, for the work you're doing. Yeah, in terms of the book, uh, which came out in, in uh, summer of 20, 2019, Death Politics, How to Heal Our Afraid Republic After Trump. I guess I had several uh, purposes in, in writing the book. The first one was actually to offer a defense of politics. Um, I did that partly because that's been an issue um, on my mind and heart uh, for most of my adult life. Um, just as a person growing up, I, I found politics um, intriguing and interesting um, as, as, as a young person, um, but I also had early on a sense that it was important. Um, and uh, the reason that I thought it was important then and now is because politics while it involves a lot of things, is fundamentally about justice and the pursuit of justice. It's always imperfect um, and it's difficult, um, like any human endeavor. But that's one of the ways we we uh, we advance it. There are a lot of others, um, and and my sense that, um, and I argue this in the book, that so much um, that matters in our lives, the things we love and care for, uh, if we get politics wrong, um, they can be destroyed. Things can go south. Um, very easily. Uh, and when politics goes right, it gives us the space and the room to, to uh, live our lives, pursue our passions, uh, and, and live fulfilled lives. Um, you know, my sense is the less involved politics is, the better it is generally for, for, a, for a country. Um, but it does matter, and it creates the parameters for, 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 uh, for, for the good life. 
Um, so that that was one. The second is I wanted to make the case and do in the book a case for democratic virtues. Um, I, I have a chapter devoted to moderation, compromise, and civility, rightly understood, um, because democracy uh, doesn't happen by itself. Um, it requires a certain disposition and actions and attitudes in, in the polity um, and, and in allegiance to certain, certain virtues. Um, we don't have to get them perfect, um, but we have to understand why they're important, why they're uh, part of the fabric of, of, of this country and our political history. So part of what I try and do is to explain why those things matter, because I think too often in our discussions, we just um, make assertions and we, we, we no longer remember or articulate for other people why those things um, matter. I also have a, a chapter in the book on the power of words, uh, which, you know, as a former speech writer and writer is close to my heart, but it's also a sense of the power of, of, of words uh, for the, for, you know, for, for the human imagination and to the capacity to stir the human heart um, and why integrity when it comes to words matter and why when you use words as weapons in politics or words to advance lies or conspiracy theories that can do grave, grave damage. And the third reason that I wrote the book um, was Donald Trump was president and I considered him a malicious and malignant threat uh, to the Republic. Um, and I felt like it was important to make the case against him. A lot of my writing since 2015 um, has, uh, I, I was, I think, relatively early in identifying the threat that Trump was and also the traction he would get in the Republican Party. And, um, and I was worried about it. And I felt like we needed to make the case against him because I felt like if we were to get through one term with him, uh, even damaged, I would take that. I'm not sure how much we could sustain if, if we got a second term. And I, I think, honestly, Michelle, um, I also felt probably an obligation to do it because I've been a lifelong Republican and was and still am a conservative. And I feel like in that case, there's probably a special responsibility to, to, uh, to speak out. So that's, those are the things that, that went into the, um, into the making of the book, the writing of the book. Thanks so much for that, Pete. So there's optimism, a lot of optimism in this book. Um, some of the quotes, what's broken can be mended, our passions can be cooled. Is it your faith that leads you to optimism, do you think? Um, and how would you describe your level of optimism three years after writing the book with whitewashing of January 6th, with continued fealty to Trump? Um, how, how, how would you place it now? Yeah. I. I mean, there was a, there there was there was a touch of I would say sort of hope in the book, um, but it, I, it was qualified hope. Uh, I was basically saying things that are broken can be mended and and passions can be cooled, uh, but I wasn't certain that they would be, and I and I wasn't certain of the of the time in terms of where I am now and my you know am I hopeful or not or my degree of worry I suppose of, of the republic. I guess I disaggregate it. In one sense, I'm. I feel better than I did when I wrote the book uh, for one main reason, which is Donald Trump. We don't have a sociopath as president. And I, and I don't mean that actually in a dis despairing way. I, I actually mean it in a, in a clinical way with all the caveats that one you know, should do, which is I'm not a psychologist. I haven't examined him. But based on my conversations with, uh, with uh, clinical psychologists and others and just observing how Donald Trump is, uh, I don't think you, um, you know, you don't need to be a car mechanic to know when your smoke's coming out of your engine that you've got a, you've got a problem or if, you know, if oil is leaking in the bottom that, that, uh, that, that you've got a problem there. So I think getting Trump out of the presidency is a pretty big deal. Um, uh, and, and in that respect, I'm, I'm glad about that. And I'm somewhat, re and I'm relieved about, about that. On the other hand, my concern is, is, um, to some degree greater now because what has happened in my estimation um, is that what had been a kind of cult of personality has spread, the pathologies have spread. And it's not really confined, the MAGA pathologies are not confined to Donald Trump. So his grip on the Republican party is obviously looser now than when he was president, that was, that was inevitable. Um, 
but the manifestations of, of, uh, of those uh, pathologies, that kind of uh, malicious and cruel politics and um, all the other things that, that, that fall under the canopy of Trumpism uh, have spread. And now you have all sorts of Republicans um, in different offices at different levels from state to, to, to Congress and, uh, and elsewhere taking up that mantle and, and giving their own flavor um, to, to it. Um, so I think they, I had conversations with a number of people um, after the election, and they were hopeful that there would be, it was one person used the phrase snapback. Um, and I think that was the wish being father of the thought. It was this notion that, you know, we had to endure four years of Trump. These are people who are uncomfortable with Trump privately, but, but publicly wouldn't, wouldn't speak out. And they thought, well, now we can go back to what it was like, the normal Republican Party, normal Democratic Party, normal politics. And I think what they didn't fully understand was, um, and, and there were people trying to ring the alarm bell you know, during the last five years, which is if you indulge the kind of conspiracy theories and, um, and, the, and the cruelty um, and the lawlessness and the norm breaking that for five years, uh, you sh you reshape the moral sensibilities of a base of a party, uh, and that happened, and and we're seeing that that uh, that play out. Um, so I'm worried where 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 the um, where the country um, where the country is. Um, you know, you need caveats, as you know, Michelle, in, in things like like this. There, there's always a danger of recency bias. Context is important. America has faced, you know more challenging times than, than now. Obviously the civil war is one example, but you go back to the, early, the founding of the Republic, the, you know, the Jefferson uh, Adams election of 1800, which almost tore the, the, the Republic apart, the uh, reconstruction after, after slavery, late sixties, early seventies. I think our, I think I would argue that our situation now is, is, is more serious in important ways than the late sixties and seventies. That was not a walk in the park. There was there were a lot of convulsions going on, and even in a there was a period of uh, from seventy one to seventy two, an eighteen month period where there were like twenty five hundred domestic bombings that it that it occurred. So we've been through through uh, through difficult periods um, before, um, and we can recover. Uh, we can recover because the American capacity for self renewal um, is 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 very very impressive. And I think we can recover because this is not like we're seized by some kind of, you know, mortal disease. Uh, we, we are, it's, it's within our capacity to write the chapters of the American story. This is a self-governing country. It's really up to us. And then the question is, you know, how do you do it? But then deeper than that is, can you summon the will? Can enough people summon the will uh, to be able to act um, in ways that, that, that are honorable? Um, and that, that stand for, for, uh, for justice. Um, I hope we can, um, I think we can, but, um, but there are reasons to, to, to be worried. Last thing I'll say about that is um, I have a friend who told me years ago, you could be a theoretical pessimist, but you ought to be an operational optimist. I think that's probably pretty good advice. Um, so wherever one falls on the spectrum of, well, you know, how pessimistic you are or, 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 or hopeful you are, the reality is that all we can do is act within our spheres of influence as individuals, as citizens, as writers, whatever your, your vocation is, um, and to try and advance what you believe to be true and right and good. Um, and then you just have to see how that, um, how that unfolds. But wherever you are on that spectrum, one should always lean in the direction of making, making things, uh, things better. Thanks so much, Pete. And so as you say in the book, um, obviously Donald Trump, the, there was fertile soil, there was a lot of frustration, economic dislocation, disenchantment with elites, cultural concerns. And so I guess that the question is, what advice do you have for responsible Republican candidates seeking office today? How should they address legitimate popular grievances without, without you know, playing on fear and anger, basically? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. I, mean, I, I guess I would say that they should, uh, <laughs> responsible Republican candidates should act responsibly. Um, none, of, none of the questions that we face um, are questions that have to be faced irresponsibly. Uh, um, 
some of them are tricky. I mean, you know, obviously, for example, abortion and Roe v. Wade is front and center right now for understandable reasons. That's a, it's been a heated debate for a long time uh, now, it's a lot of passions that are going on. But um, reasonable people and thoughtful people can hold different positions on that and talk about them in different, in different ways, you know, in ways that doesn't necessarily inflame, inflame the public or caricature people with, with whom one dis, disagrees. The way I think about the Republican Party now isn't, uh, you know, in terms of what, what a responsible Republican would say about any issue under the sun, it's whether they can win if they don't speak irresponsibly. And that I think goes to a deep problem here, which is the base of, of the Republican Party, by and large, not in every case, but by and large, has been radicalized. And it's almost a ticket of admission to the Republican Party to speak in ways that are often reckless and irresponsible and flat out untrue. I mean, we've seen this with the polls uh, about the number of Republicans who believe the election was, was, you know, was stolen. And that's a hu hugely damaging, injurious lie um, to this country for, for all sorts of, of, of reasons. And yet there are very, very few Republicans who, um, who are willing publicly uh, to, to speak out um, uh, against it. Um, you know, if you, if you pressed me and said, well, who, you know, who are the Republicans there or what, what would be the grounds of some degree of, of hope? There, there's a spectrum. I, uh, I, you know, different Republicans are going to run different ways, depending on the region of the country that they're in, depending on what office that they're in. Um, but you have people from Liz Cheney at one end, and I admire Liz Cheney very, very much, and I hope she wins. But there's been a tremendous cost to her in the party um, because she's gone straight on, head on, right into the into in, into MAGA world and the lies of MAGA world and the lies of, of Donald Trump. You know, then in the Senate, you have people like Ben Sass and Mitt Romney, uh, who I think are eminently reasonable and responsible um, people. Actually, just around here, I, I live in Virginia. You've you've got Larry Hogan of Maryland. You know, potentially Glenn Youngkin uh, in in Virginia. He's 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 uh, some people are, I think are uncomfortable with with how he ran the campaign, but he certainly would be an improvement from most of of uh, of MAGA world. Then there are people like um, Bill Haslam, who's a former governor of Ten Tennessee. Um, so you know, there there are people out there, but they're not many. Um, and everybody knows that if you take a strong position on these issues like like the election and and any number of other ones um, that you're going to be uh, targeted by uh, by the base um, and then it depends on having public officials show some measure of courage and certainly in the republican party that hasn't been in <laughs> much supply you know john kennedy said uh, after he wrote or after ted sorenson wrote whoever wrote uh, uh, co-wrote Profiles and Courage, uh, Kennedy said there's a reason that it was a thin volume. And we've certainly seen that illustrated in, in the last years in the Republican Party in particular. Thanks, Pete. So I think it might be interesting to hear from you on, on um, evangelical trends since you follow them so closely. Um, I recall, you know, in, in, you know, in the months following January 6th, I recall reading articles on, you know, reckonings and, um, people kind of splits within the church and and there seemed to be I, I don't know there seemed to be some movement but I haven't read a whole lot I, I can't say I read a whole lot of articles like that and so could you could you kind of update us on what the scene looks like today and and what your advice would be you know where there's a Trump-like mentality that has a hold what your advice how could possibly be broken yeah yeah that's that's a very interesting question um I mean I would say that I, I should should say just as a as a, as a context there that I'm a person of the of the Christian faith, um, and that's very central to my own life. Uh, and so I would say pretty the most painful thing of the last six years um, has been what I think is the corruption of many parts of the Christian Church, particularly the white evangelical um, church. Um, it didn't absolutely shock me. I, as you mentioned, I, Mike, Mike Gerson and I had written a book back in 2011, City Man, 
Uh, so I was aware of, 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 of some of the fault lines here, some of the problems. It's not as if what we're seeing now is unprecedented. We saw it with the moral majority and Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson and any number of other people in the, in the 80s. So this is not a completely new phenomenon, but it's extremely widespread. And um, I wrote a piece in the Atlantic in last October on the breakup of the evangelical church. And I reached out, it was, it was a very heavily reported piece. I reached out to probably, I don't know, 50, 60, maybe more uh, theologians, pastors, people in um, ministry, youth ministry, campus ministry, as other people of, of, of faith. And my supposition uh, was that the, the uh, churches were being broken apart and fractured in a way that hadn't happened in, in my lifetime. It was interesting to me, Michelle, is that nobody disputed the premise. I mean, I thought some people would say, oh, you know, you're watching, you know, it's just CNN is profiling this, or the New York Times is, is hyper-focusing because they want to push a certain narrative. Nobody told me that. A number of people said, you don't know the half of it, many of whom are pastors. The divisions within the church now um, is, I would say, unprecedented in, in, in modern times in the American church. Um, and um, and it's, it's taken a, a tremendous toll on congregations, and, but especially, I would say, pastors, many of whom want to leave. Um, the church has become um, not just politicized, but, but uh, it's almost become central to the identity of people who, of the Christian, Christian faith. So um, a, a spiritual or uh, outlook has been replaced by, by a, a core identity that's, that's political. And what's happening now, which really is, uh, un, I think, unprecedented, I was actually on a, on a Zoom call yesterday with a, a well-known pastor and, we were, and some others, and we were talking about this, which is in the past when you had heated debates and divisions within the church, the differences were had to do with with faith, with doctrine, uh, you know, hermeneutics, the inerrancy of scripture, not the nature of the Trinity, the creeds. That's not what's happening now. Those are now secondary. It's now things like critical race theory or Disney or where you stand on Trump or masks or vaccines. Um, so that that's something new and and I think very worrisome and quite um, quite quite telling. And my view is that when that happens to, to the church, when it becomes identified, so fundamentally identified with politics, it becomes a repository not of grace, which should characterize churches, uh, but of grievances. Um, and these tribal loyalties are reinforced rather than challenged, which, which again, I think a, a, a correct reading of the um, of, uh, uh, of Christianity, would, 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 that's where it would lead you. Uh, fears are being nurtured. You know, it's one of the most frequent um, commands in the, in the Hebrew scriptures and in the New Testament is fear not, be not afraid. But boy, I'm telling you, if you go into, into Christian churches now, there's just this existential fear um, that, is, that is just coursing through and a kind of uh, aggression and then a nastiness. Um, the, the interesting thing or what was really a tell kind of MRI on maybe on the soul of, the, of, of a lot of white evangelical churches, it wasn't the election between Trump and Clinton, because there you could make an argument. I didn't agree with it, but I understood it, which is Trump's agenda would advance the common good in a way that they thought Hillary Clinton wouldn't. The real tell was the um, GOP primary, right? That there you had 16 Republicans, any kind of flavor of ice cream you wanted, libertarian, cultural, culture warrior, uh, reform conservative, um, you know, you name it, it was there. And then you had this guy, Donald Trump, who had no history with the Republican Party, who had held previously some very liberal views, had given money to the Clintons and so forth. And yet they rallied to him and they rallied to him at the cost of jettisoning almost everything that they had said they believed in, right? So these were the leading voices on morality, the centrality of, of morality in public leaders. These were the people that, that most uh, stood up and took a, a figurative two by four upside the head of Bill Clinton because of the Lewinsky scandal. And then you get somebody like Donald Trump whose corruptions are borderless. 
And they not only uh, voted for him, but they, but they rallied for him. They were energized behind him. That was an indication that something was deeply, um, deeply amiss. The way I described it at the time was that what they wanted is somebody to bring a gun to a cultural knife fight. And uh, and that person with the, with with the gun was was uh, was Donald Trump. But just to finish the, the, where 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 I began on on this part, um, it's done tremendous damage to to the to the uh, witness of the Christian Church, in my estimation. Uh, the, the harm that that has been done by a lot of white evangelical Christians in politics overwhelms any damage that the so-called new atheists uh, could um, could could possibly could possibly do in terms of what can be done about it uh, just very briefly and part of it is catechesis it's this notion of shame, shaping uh, and, and the formation of moral character and spiritual character um, which is clearly not um, not gone on um, I think it requires a kind of uh, investment in 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 uh, uh, by pastors um, to to lean into this problem, to name it rather than to ignore it, uh, and to work together. I think some isolation has to go on because in a lot of churches, it only takes a small handful of agitated, galvanized people to um, to really create problems in a church. But most people in churches, that's not what they're going there for, and you have to find ways to rally it. And the last thing I would say, uh, again here speaking as a Christian, is um, it would be nice if people who claim to be followers of Jesus actually reacquainted themselves or acquainted themselves for the first time with the actual Jesus, with the Jesus of the Gospels. And I think when you wander away from that, if um, if if you have the superstructure of of religion, the rules of religion, but in my in my mind, your heart hasn't been won over often faith is counterproductive because politics is passionate enough. And if you add, overlay on that, the attitudes of religion, children of light, children of darkness, good and evil, we are the repository of all truth. They're the repository of all error. That makes your politics even worse. And I think we've, we've, um, we've, we've seen that. Thank you so much, Pete. Well, with that, I'd love to open it up to questions. Um, I see Fritz Heinzen has his hands up. So let's start with Fritz. And uh, if y'all, if others would kindly raise their hand or feel free to put a question into chat and we'll ask if you'd like us to call on you directly, but we can always read it if you prefer. Thanks Fritz. Thanks Pete. Um, I, I met Pete uh, about 36 years ago or so when Ethics and Public Policy Center was doing a book by Brzezinski yeah. uh, on SDI. And I was doing my dissertation on SDI. So brought in to provide somewhat expert advice or less than expert advice. But since, since I had met you, I've read over the years, your many articles, your books, and um, I've heard you speak. And you often cite your parents, the influence of your parents and your parents from Germany. And so I have just a quick question. I have a more substantive one, but my quick question for you is this. Where were they from? The fact that they've had such a significant impact, where in Germany were they from? Um, my uh, dad was born in Wiesbaden and my mom in uh, Strasbourg. And um, yeah, and they influenced me. I, one is just they were, they were wonderful parents and, and loved me very much. And, uh, and um, uh, I'm one of four, four, uh, four children. Um, and I, I think partly the, the immigrant experience with them. They had a kind of immigrant's love for, for America, um, which, um, which, which shaped me. I think my political views were, were, were certainly shaped by them. My, they, they weren't ideologues. They were conservative leaning, Republican leaning. And I'm sure that, 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 you know, that influenced me like a lot of kids when you're in elementary or junior high or high school, you know, you take on often the views of your, of your parents. Um, but you know, my, I had conversations with 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 uh, with them. We we had a cabin out in the Cascade Mountains, and we used to on car rides out there. We go out every weekend and talk about politics. And I was just a question asker then, as now, and so I, I would just pepper them with questions: why this, why that, um, and um, and um, they travel a lot. So it, I think it they helped give me a sort of wider perspective than I than I would otherwise have had. Well, wonderful cities. I visited and spent time in both, and uh, I can see a very positive influence uh, from, from that. All right, now on to, on to this. 
Uh -huh. Okay, wonderful book. Uh, autographed copy, thanks to uh, Sheree uh, Harder. It, 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 it's such an interesting book. I so appreciate your approach, your positive approach. Now, here comes the problem and leads to the question, and sure. it's this. I have tried to get younger, the younger generation, folks graduating from college, recently graduated from college, that type of group, to read the book. Mm -hmm. And I'm running into a problem. Mm -hmm. I'm fortunately old enough. I remember Bob Michael. I, I actually did a TV show with Bob Michael. I knew his staff. Everett Dirksen, I knew many of the people who worked for him. I knew these kinds of people. This younger generation doesn't see this. They don't know this type of thing. They don't know that there can be something positive, good, hard workers. You know, Dana Milbank's upcoming book, he starts with Bob Michael. And it's so interesting that that's sort of a, there's sort of a cutoff. And, and so the folks who are coming after that cutoff don't necessarily see this or know this. And so I've had trouble getting them read it because they're so cynical. They're beyond my cynicism. Yeah. So I'm curious, what kind of a reaction have you had in talking about your book or in talking in general to mm -hmm. younger generation? And then the second part of this question, how about with those, let's say, of the Trump persuasion, have any of them come back to you and said, hey, Pete, wow, you're, you're right. You're right. What are we doing? I don't understand this. This is, this is we've, we've gotten out of control. So are you getting positive feedback from two groups of people that I'd love to see appreciate what your work says? Yeah, thanks, Fritz. Um, yeah, very quickly. In terms of the, the reaction for the younger people, I mean, I, I would say sort of pleasantly positive. I, I would grant your premise. Uh, they're cynical, and I understand obviously why they're cynical, because the politics is a kind of moral freak show right now. And, um, and so there's, there's not a lot there where you look at it and say, boy, that's, th th those are people whom I respect or people I'd like to, like to, to emulate. I, d I do find that when you get into these conversations about why politics matters and about justice, um, that, that they care about that, um, that, they, that they care about politics, I think, in a more fundamental, fundamental sense. And I think, at least in my conversations, when you explain that there's a lot that's at stake here, as I was saying earlier in my uh, preliminary comments about uh, about politics, both the good that it can do and the bad that can happen when 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 it uh, when it goes south, um, I think they lock in lock in on uh, on uh, on that. So I think there's a sort of cynicism or sense that you know wh why would you get involved or the, or the people are just spinning their wheels. Honestly, if you talk to senators, uh, you know as I have and, and others in Congress, I mean they feel like they're spinning their wheels too. That's the nature of you know a friend of many of ours, uh, Yuval Levin, um, has, has written a book about institutions and he talks about uh, uh, people who have become performative rather than formative when it comes to institutions. That is instead of allowing institutions to form who we are, we view all sorts of institutions as stages where, where, we, where we perform. In terms of the, the, the Trump response and, and what, I've, what I've gotten, uh, some of it's interesting. I, I've, I'm actually in correspondence with somebody uh, who's a public commentator who had been very much in favor of Trump. And when Trump turned on someone whom he likes, Mike Pence, he uh, will now be sending me, in fact, he did this morning, um, articles or emails um, talking about uh, how bad Trump is. This was this is a, a real uh, uh, reversal of opinion for him. It's unfortunate that what led him that he didn't speak out when I think he should have known better during the Trump years, and that the reason he did was again tribalistic. It was that someone whom he liked is now being attacked by Trump. So that so that sort of broke him of the of the spell. I'd say the most interesting thing that I've uh, my experience has been with with people who are who are Trump supporters has just been in conversation with them, um, and I spent a lot of time both trying to keep relationships because, of course, I came from a Republican world um, that's and that put a lot of strain on longtime friendships, people who felt like I was betraying the cause, um, and um, so. 
I, I, uh, it's very meaningful to me, friendships and relationships, and I've tried very hard not to lose them over over uh, the, the Trump years. I think overall I've done pretty well at that, but 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 it's not always easy. But I do try and listen to where they're coming from uh, and try and understand where they're coming from, um, both for my own education. Just to, so when I try and represent what they believe, I want to actually honestly represent what they believe, not not what I've caricatured up. But also some understanding of, uh, 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 you know, John Roush is on, on the call and he, he wrote a, a wonderful book, Constitution of Knowledge, about in part the, the importance of uh, epistemic humility, this, this notion that none of us knows everything and all of us are blind to some things. And I am too. Um, and it's easier for other people to see it than it is for me. Um, so I try, uh, I try and learn from it. I've had some fruitful conversations with people. What I found, and actually, uh, I think probably Luke and Braver Angels, is, I know they have a lot more to say about it than, than I do. You're not going to um, out argue someone out of deep convictions. Uh, you're not going to pummel them you know, with data and with you know, 10 arguments. All it's going to do is make people dig in their heels. So to the degree that, that meaningful conversations that I've had with people who are in Trump world, it's usually been because I've been able to connect with them on some other frequency um, of life. And they feel that there's some degree of trust and they don't feel like they're under assault or under attack or, or being condescended to. Um, but having said that, these are very deeply held convictions and um, it's, it's not an easy time to have conversations with people who will differ views. Well, thanks, Pete, and keep fighting for a more fruitful politics. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks, Fritz. So we've got Jonathan Rausch, Daniel Stid, and then Luke Phillips, who'd like to ask a question after that. Jonathan, please, the floor is yours. Um, thank you all. Thank you, Pete, especially for the book plug. I'll, I'll put a link to the book in the chat if, if anyone's interested. Um, Pete, something I've, I've grown accustomed to hearing you say over the years is that sometimes viruses produce their own antibodies. And I wonder how you think we're doing on the antibody front. And, and if I could just, just frame that question a little bit. Um, I think people like you and me and a lot of folks on this call assumed for a while that what was happening was that um, conservative leaders like Trump and Fox News were leading the base astray. I was reading just started John Avalon's book on, uh, on Lincoln and learned something new, which is that um, no state had a referendum on secession in the 1850s because they would have lost. The public wasn't for it. It was an elite movement. And I kind of think we thought that was the model, but um, it looks increasingly like both in the pews and in politics, it's the, the base that's leading the leaders astray. Um, the members of the church will simply wander off and find another church or abandon Fox News if the leaders are not radicalized enough. So if that's the problem, uh, if it's not a top-down problem, if it's being led by the base and a demand for this kind of anti-politics, um, what's your assessment of where we are in terms of antibodies? Sorry about the long question. No, it's a, it was, it was a very good, it's a very good question. <clears throat> uh, yeah, let, let me... Um... Let me disaggregate it a little bit. I, I think you're you're partly right, John, in terms of your analysis about um, about Trump and the base. But I, I may I maybe qualify it some or, or add some amendments to it. Um, it certainly wasn't the case. I think it's simplified and, and just flat out wrong just to say that that Trump led the base astray or that he hijacked the party. He didn't hijack the party. Um, as I was saying earlier, there was there was a field of sixteen candidates, um, and uh, nobody forced them in their primaries to vote for Donald Trump. They did it w willingly and willfully, and again, they did it contrary to almost all the political convictions that I'm sure that they authentically thought they held for 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 many many years. My analysis of it, my critique of it, is that. These currents were happening for a while and you could detect them. Like if you listened as I have to talk radio, you could begin to see how a right wing talk radio began to shift in the middle and late 2000s and early 2010s. Prior to that, it had been a kind of binary conservative liberal. Increasingly, what happened if you listen to Rush Limbaugh or Mark Levin or others is it became establishment anti-establishment. So by the time you got into like early 2010s, 
tens and you listen to like Mark Levin or something, he would almost be as likely to go after John Boehner or Mitch McConnell's Barack Obama for being rhinos and so forth. Um, so this populist, and you saw it when I was in the Bush administration, we pushed for comprehensive immigration reform. And the reason that it lost was because there was an uprising in the base of the Republican Party on immigration. So it's a very different attitude than it was in the 80s with Ronald Reagan and with uh, the 90s with George H.W. Bush and, and certainly with George W. Bush. So things were percolating. Uh, and you saw it, my, my first piece that I was critical of Donald Trump was in 2011, actually, in the Wall Street Journal called The GOP and the Birther Trap. And that was my first flare about Donald Trump. And basically what I argued, obviously you can Google it if you want, but I said, don't play footsie with these conspiracy theories. You're going to pay a price, you know, if you do. But he was getting traction and salience. So this was all in place. Then he ran. Um, and these, these currents were str getting stronger and, and stronger. Uh, I think what's different is that in the past, these elements both on the left and the right exist, fringe elements all the time. You can't really get politics without it happening. What you've had in the past are responsible authority figures who, who said no, no to this. And they had authority at the time because there was greater trust in institutions. To some degree, Bill Buckley did that with the John Birch Society. Reagan did it when he was president and other Republicans, the Bushes did it. Trump, of course, didn't do it. He just lit, put lighter fluid on all of these things and, and, and lit a match. So that's my critique of, of, of what happened. In terms of the viruses creating the antibodies, um, I don't see those antibodies kicking in on the American right. Um, what my, my hope was, I hope at some point they do, but in the short term, what I had in mind was the antibodies for the people who are not part of the American right, the so-called exhausted majority, the people who came out to vote for, for Joe Biden, you know, in huge numbers compared to what Hillary Clinton got. There are many more people in this country that uh, I think are, are, are worried to appalled at what's happening to our politics, but a very significant portion of, of a minority like it. Um, but that puts particular burden and duties on the rest of us to speak out. There are a lot of different ways that one can, can do this, a lot of different, different approaches. There, I think in a way, the antibodies are kicking in. I do think that there, you, you see people speaking up, you see institutions being created, uh, and a lot of thought on what do we do given this perilous state of American, American democracy. But I don't know if those antibodies are gonna kick in um, strongly enough and soon enough and you may get a majority that wants to stop this, but if you have, obviously if anybody familiar with, with history knows that if you have an energized minority uh, intent on doing damage, you know, they can, they can carry the day. Thanks so much, Pete. So Daniel, to you, please. Uh, thanks, thanks, Pete. And thanks American Purpose and Brave Angels for, for hosting this. Um, Pete, I, I have a, a question for you about your personal journey. Um, uh -huh. over the past, you know, 10 years or so. And, and if I may, pizza friends, so I'll, I'll, I'll be so bold as to say that you, you come from the establishment, right? You worked in the White Houses of Reagan and the Bushes. And right. you know, if, if this group had assembled 10 years ago and, you know, wanted to identify who would be the most uh, vociferous critic of, the, of a Republican president in the direction of the Republican Party, you would not have been at the top of the list. So you, you have uh, really... Uh, you know, kind of gone in unpredictable directions. And I just, uh, 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 and those are directions I think, frankly, many more of us will need to go on. So I'm just wondering, how have you kind of grappled with your own role in, in the loyalties that you felt to a party and to, um, you know, a group of people that I'm presuming, and, and time and again, you've had to sunder them and, 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 and kind of trying to do what you think is, and say what is the right thing for the country. So how have you navigated that? What's been hard about it? What's been easy? What's been encouraging? What's been uh, daunting as you've gone through that? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Uh, thanks, thanks, Daniel, for, for asking it. Um, I'd, I'd answer it s several ways. Um, I, uh, I think the first thing that I, I would say is that I always considered myself 
uh, a conservative more than a Republican. Um, to me, the, the the party was was a vehicle or a vessel in which to advocate, pursue um, a philosophy and certain policies that I thought were were good for the country. Um, and there are other people who are involved in policies who are just different. They, 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 for them, you know, a party is primus inter paris, and the, the, those are the loyalties that they had. Um, the break for me when it came to Trump, I think, was perhaps easier than for some people, um, because when it became clear to me, just in in, in one respect, um, that he was not not only not a conservative figure, but he was a threat to conservatism as I've understood it, um, certainly in temperament and disposition, but in so many different ways. Um, and, and my warning to Republicans at the time is that Donald Trump would do more harm to conservatism as president than Hillary Clinton would by light years, because that would, because she couldn't shake the Republican party and, and conservatism, but if he won the nomination, and certainly if he won the presidency, he he would. I think that's that's uh, that's happened. S second is, you're absolutely right. I mean, I've been a Republican. Well, I mean, my first vote for president was in college was was for Reagan, and I served in three Republican administrations. You know, I, I've he, he, pre-Trump. If if you went back and read my writings, you know, I I would call out Republicans at different times, uh, Newt Gingrich, and, and there are a lot of different people over the years, Michelle Bachman and so forth, that um, I really didn't feel any problem. I felt like as a writer, um, it was my own sense of what you know intellectual integrity would, would require, just in terms of using a similar standard to, to different people. Um, so I, I'm sure I didn't do it as much as I, I should have, but, but I did it to some degree. And, and I think it wasn't as if it was a, a leap for me to 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 make to make that. Third thing I say, Daniel, is I would say if you if if you had named pre-Trump years, you know, to, if you named the twenty or twenty-five people that I felt like knew me best, who loved me most, who I, I would have said kind of understood most fundamentally who I was. I'd say the overwhelming number of those people wouldn't be surprised at the stand I took and would have been disappointed in me if I had taken a stand other than what I did. Um, and that matters to me. I, I don't really care if I'm criticized by a lot of people. Uh, that's just the nature of politics. If people have standing in my life and they come to me and say something in any area of my life, I like to think that I'll, get, I'll I'll try and listen carefully and think is there something something here, um, but in the case of Trump, the, the people that I had trusted pre-Trump, so I don't think this was selective. I think saw things largely the way I I um, I was. Having said all of that, I mean it's been it's been difficult uh, because of the strains and because as I was saying earlier, it's that's that's the world I came from and a lot of. Uh, colleagues, you know, over the years have have, have been there, and um, and there's just a lot of energy um, if you if you're as vocal as I've been and as public as I have been in a in an atmosphere that's that's like uh, that's like uh, like this. Um, so um, you know that's 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 probably been the the, the the hardest thing. But but honestly, my stand on Trump. Uh, was almost instantaneous. It was so obvious to me from my perspective, my life experience, whatever it is that shapes who I am, that we were dealing with somebody who was uniquely dangerous and pernicious. And um, the idea that I wouldn't have uh, spoken up against him uh, is, 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 would be hard for me to, to imagine. Thank you so much, Pete. Thanks, Daniel. So next we have Luke Phillips, please, Luke, you ready? Pete, thanks for being here and uh, giving this talk. Uh, I was wondering if you believe that there are uh, beliefs, ideas, principles, ideologies, maybe temperaments, et cetera, um, that in and of themselves are so dangerous and so antithetical to American government 
that they cannot be constrained or channeled by the Madisonian system of channeling popular passions and political interests in the American constitution and the party system. Are there un-American ideas that are entirely illegitimate within the American party system that simply cannot be uh, sublimated by the American political system? Yeah, it's an interesting question, Luke. Um, I guess the way I would view it or the way I would approach it is there are all sorts of ideas that are out there that are antithetical to the, the American ideals and the American idea and that can subvert democracy. Um, and they've existed before Trump came on the scene, they'll exist long after Trump came onto the scene. That's just the nature of, of, of political life and human life, particularly in a country of 350 million people. Um, so those, you know, those always exist. I think the question is whether the institutions are strong enough, governing institutions and other institutions are strong enough to resist them in some cases, um, or to rechannel them in, um, in, in, uh, in others. Um, and, uh, and that I think is, is the, uh, you know, is an open question. Um, I, I think that, uh, I, I should say also just as a kind of historical context here that, uh, you know, probably my favorite of the of of the founders. Uh, I think that I can speak for Daniel too, who is Madison. Um, I mean, understood, right? When he, yeah, there yeah, there you go. When he went to the Constitutional Convention, uh, you know, he went to Philadelphia, as somebody once said, with Athens on his mind. He would read, as you know, he had borrowed Jefferson's Library. He had done this unbelievably comprehensive reading of of history and of political systems. And so what was his main concern and the concern of a lot of the other founders? It was the danger of mob rule and demagogues. And it, it, in the Federalist paper, he said it had every uh, Athenian citizen been a Socrates, every Athenian assembly would still have been a mob, right? So he knew that it was, the, it was human nature that could lead us and that democracy itself was not an easy thing to establish. That was, I think, the central great insight of the founders was it's a setup of political system through checks and balances and, uh, and um, separation of powers uh, that would deal with these factions and so forth. So I think that's, that's the question. I wouldn't you know, say, look, this person is sort of out of bounds. I mean, you can get into free speech issues, but there are a lot of noxious ideas out there um, and we're not gonna get rid of them. Um, but the question is, can we contain them? Can we convert them to some extent? In the past, we've done it pretty well. Um, we're not doing it so well now. And the institutions held up during the Trump years, but it was closer than it should have been. And a couple of different people here or there, you know, at, uh, at this court or at that, at, at that Justice Department, uh, things could have gone much worse, or even if, you know, who knows if Pence, I mean, Pence didn't have an official role, but if he'd have acted differently than he, than he did, you know, that could have, could have lit some, lit some fires that we're not dealing with. So, you know, the institutions held up pretty, pretty well. Um, and I'm very glad about that. And, you know, a tip of the hat to the founders, but institutions over time can't sustain themselves unless you have individuals whose character and dispositions and temperaments will lend support to those institutions. Institutions don't, don't survive or live apart from individuals. They're comprised of, of, um, of individuals. Um, so I think we have the best system that you could have to, to get through this, these moments. Um, but um, but uh, it, it's, it's, it requires a lot of work. Thanks so much, Pete. David Galbraith, please. And you just, you're on mute. Thanks. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And welcome. I'm speaking to you where I live and teach in England. Um, thank you, Peter, for your presentation tonight and Michelle for, and others for hosting this event. Uh, looking at things from this side of the pond, I've been int very intrigued for a long time how Sections of the evangelical right have, have, have kind of hijacked the Republican Party and vice versa on two main issues morally, but, you know, the, the, the pro-life agenda, um, pro-Israel. And I know that 
some of the kind of inspirational writers I've read, such as Jim Wallace, he may come across Jim Wallace, The Sojourners. Yeah. I know he's worked really hard at trying to broaden the Christian message in terms of its interconnections with politics. So Jim Wallace would talk about the need for Christians to address social justice in a broader sense, addressing healthcare, education needs, and so on, <clears throat> which seems self-evidently obvious to me. And yet, uh, I think I share your angst over this, Peter, in that that breadth of Christian message and ethics doesn't seem to have gained a lot of traction. It's some of these kind of too narrow th thrusts with the evangelical right, which the Republican Party seem to seem to really like. And I wonder what can be done of that, done about that. Is there any progress to be made? Is Jim Wallace et al? Are they just simply blowing against the wind here? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, you know, I I'd say that that question would have been more front and center to me um, probably eight years ago than it is than it is now, and and I'll tell you why, because I I think you're right. At that time, the Christians involved in politics was largely not exclusively, but largely based on a set of policy issues and a policy agenda. Um, and it had various various components to it. And my own critique at, at, at that time and continues to be so, some of some of those views um, I'm sympathetic to, um, some of them less so. But I always found that the, that the aperture was not nearly wide enough uh, and that uh, a full, honest um, understanding of what a Christian ethic would be as it relates to, to politics. And it's a tricky issue um, because in, in my estimation, Christianity should stand in judgment of all ideologies and all political parties. Um, but I think it has things to say in moments of justice, right? So that's, that's, that's the tension. So, you know, I'm conservative leaning, but again, with, you know, it would depend on particular particular issues. I would say today we're in a different moment. And I'd say like the rest of the country, or at least the rest of the Republican party, what's animating involvement in politics is not, are, are not issues uh, so much as temperament and, and, and a kind of dyspeptic uh, anger, angst. Um, and that is what's, what's, I think, driving it. There's just a tremendous amount of fury. Um, like, you, you know, you come across like, why on earth did masks become a culture war issue uh, or vaccines? Something really weird is going is going on, and it was predominant, not exclusively by any means, obviously, but it was predominant in white evangelical churches. And so, in that article I was doing, and in my own ongoing conversations with pastors, the issue of of, of masks has you know has broken churches. This is like insane. Um, and you would think, even if you even if your views were you know cloth masks are marginally good or maybe not good at all. The idea that this was some sort of huge imposition on 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 one's liberty, or even as a Christian, that you couldn't, out of out of some de degree of charity toward other people, wear masks, you know, because you go into giant or because you go into church, but instead you 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 would you would uh, basically go to war, you know, over this is is very bad. So I think that it's it's not the the issues agenda. I think are just subordinated. To in a lot of cases, not in all cases, and and you know the number of Christians in this country is extremely large. Evangelical Christians, it's maybe is between a fifth and a third of the country. So there are a lot of really good people who have their uh, you know moral headgear on, completely fine. But there are far too many that have gotten politicized. And, and as I was saying earlier, I think what has really been revealed in a pretty stunning, not stunning, because it's not shocking, but um, discouraging way is how for people who proclaim, in the case of Christianity, that to be the most important thing in their life, the you know, most central to who they are, um, to have that 
so subordinated to a cultural agenda, a sociological agenda, a political agenda, and then not being aware of it. I don't think a lot of them are being cynical. I think what they think is the view I hold on X issue, you know, the Trump being or, or vaccines or whatever, is somehow synonymous with faith. They think that's where it leads them, which itself is 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 a very complicated and 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 troubling development. So if if we could get Christians um, temperamentally and dispositionally in a place where they're agents of grace, advocates of reconciliation, um, you know, that I would love that. And then we can deal with the issues after that. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Thank you so much, Pete. It's been such a pleasure spending this hour with you. I know that the audience members have written into chat how much they've enjoyed it. And um, we're so grateful to you for coming. Thanks to everyone who participated. Thanks on behalf of Jeff. And thank you to Luke and Braver Angels. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks for take, attending. Take care, Pete. Great Bye -bye. to see you. Thank you.